Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the July 6, 2020 informal commission meeting. Uh, it's good to see Commissioner Hodges here. Uh, good to have you back. And uh, somebody else was under the weather. Commissioner Chandler, I hope your mom, correct? Hope she's doing well. Good to see you back as well. Uh, we're going to call the meeting to order. We have three presentations. Uh, our first one is for uh, animal care and control update. Mr. Kasky, good evening. Good evening. I did have a PowerPoint, but um, there's some technical difficulties with that. So I'll give the update the best I can with uh, okay. my notes. And if you would, if you'll email that PowerPoint to uh, Kyle, he'll share it with all the commissioners. I will do that. I appreciate it. Um, so I just kind of want to go over our uh, first year uh, IGSA agreement with uh, Fort Campbell and just kind of give you some updates as to where we're at, how we've done this last year. So in uh, March of 2018, when I first arrived at Fort Campbell, it actually initially approached us. Um, to provide stray animal control on their facility. Uh, we chose at that time to um, wait a year just to see so I could uh, have time to adjust to the community and uh, the facility. Uh, in March, I'm sorry, in uh, late or early uh, 2019, we uh, started discussions again and uh, we came to an agreement in uh, May of 2019, which uh, was approved by the County Commission and we had the signing on June 6th of 2019, uh, which was also the uh, very first IGSA Fort Campbell has entered into in their history. Uh, it was our goal first and foremost to establish a partnership with Fort Campbell and their community. Um, we wanted it to develop into a long uh, relationship, so we created a long lasting community partnership that was committed to pri providing the same level of service that we provide uh, the Montgomery County community. Uh, since uh, we started in July 5th of 2019, we've had uh, many key accomplishments at Fort Campbell. And I'd just like to share some of those with you. Uh, we had renewed a memorandum of understanding with the 72nd Veterinary Detachment on Fort Campbell. Uh, they uh, actually are veterinarians that go out in the field during um, uh, deployment and they provide us with uh, free spay and neuter surgeries as well as crucial training um, to our staff. And it provides their veterinary staff with uh, training in the field. Uh, this MOU has allowed us to uh, an element of life-saving measures that we wouldn't normally have uh, with being able to have our, uh, many of our dogs and cats spayed and neutered, uh, which makes them more adaptable. We also establish a strong working relationship with the Fort Campbell Veterinary Center uh, which is right next door to our stray animal facility. Uh, they provide essential sight, limb, and life treatment to all animals that come into the uh, Fort Campbell stray animal facility. Uh, this actually saves us thousands of dollars because they provide the service free of charge to us. We are also invited uh, by the uh, Fort Campbell Veterinary Facility, we are invited uh, to assist in the uh, reestablishment of the cam rigs, which was extremely outdated when we took over. Uh, the cam rigs basically regulates how animal control and welfare is regulated on post. So our input um, helped them a great deal in renewing those uh, cam rigs for not only the military police, but uh, the uh, emergency communication center. Uh, we also establish a very strong relationship with the military police and the emergency communication center. Um, they actually now contact us on a lot of their cases for assistance as far as providing input on animal welfare, uh, how we might handle a case, how to write reports. So it's been, uh, it's been really nice to be able to, whenever we have a call, we can con contact them by phone and they actually drop what they do to come and assist us on post. Uh, part of uh, the uh, original IGSA is allowing us to use the stray animal facility on post. And with that, we've been able to actually move 110 dogs and cats between our shelter and the shelter on post. Um, so if we have uh, a 
time where we get to critical capacity at the shelter, we can actually move dogs and cats up to open spaces at Fort Campbell until they're either ready to be adopted, go to rescue, or to be spayed and neutered. And through the ongoing uh, partnership, uh, we also, um, so the vet center next door, they actually come and do inspections monthly on our facility. And one of the deficiencies they found um, wasn't our fault, but the facility doesn't have an area that can quarantine animals away from the rest of the population. So through that, we were actually be able to um, express our frustration with that, and uh, Fort Campbell has agreed to uh, now construct a $500,000 addition to that facility, so we have a quarantine area. And the most uh, important number to us and the biggest accomplishment we've made out there is we actually have a 99.6% save rate on the facility, which actually classifies that facility as a no-kill shelter now. So just some numbers I'll run through for uh, this last year for Fort Campbell. We had 337 calls for service. Um, the uh, staff had a total of 357 animals that were intaked. Uh, we had 81 total animals transferred to rescue from Fort Campbell. 127 animals were returned to their owners in the field and over the counter. We had 98 total adoptions. Euthanasia, we had six uh, total, two dogs and one ca or, uh, four cats. And we had over 1,000 visitors come through the shelter. And we had 84 dogs and 45 cats that were transferred between Fort Campbell and our facility to reduce overcrowding in our main shelter. Of the uh, 84 dogs and 45 cats that were transferred to Fort Campbell um, from our main shelter, uh, we had a 92% life saving rate. So those are animals that were from our shelter going to Fort Campbell. So out of those 110 animals, 49 dogs and cats were adopted. 52 dogs and cats were transferred to rescue. Uh, 10 dogs and cats were actually reclaimed by the original owners. Uh, three animals went to foster care and four currently remain in the shelter waiting for adoption. So uh, part of when we started this IGSA, uh, one thing we approached Fort Campbell about is we wanted to know what services they wanted to see from us. And the biggest thing was they wanted to see more proactiveness in their community, which they uh, didn't have with previous contractors. And through that, being proactive, meaning our officers were actually going out actively patrolling the community, uh, engaging folks in the community, and working with the military police. Um, we actually saw a reduction from previous years under the previous contractors. So uh, in uh, so up to 2018, Activity calls previously had been around the 640 per year. Our first year we had 337, which is a 47% reduction. Animal intakes past years has been over 560 a year. Uh, we had 357 this last year, which is a 36% reduction. Um, and return to owners, uh, Gauging on the number of intakes they had, they had 225, which is a 55% return to owner rate. We had 127, which is a 65% return rate. And the last thing I have is in the terms of actual revenue, I know that was uh, one of the uh, things we wanted this to be mutually, mutually beneficial, not only for ourselves, but Fort Campbell as well is in the terms of actual revenue. Our personnel costs uh, for the first year were 165,120 actual costs to uh, Montgomery County. Fort Campbell had been billed 254,691, which is about $89,000 difference. Our total revenue for year one was $47,526, but it's actually more than that, because that's not including the $100,000 that we got up front uh, prior to the start of the IGSA for the purchase of our vans and uh, communication equipment. Any questions of Mr. Kasky? Yes, could you have 254000 what was that? I'm sorry. Oh, the, uh, so the build Fort Campbell cost was uh, the, for the personnel, the build Fort Campbell cost was 254691 We build Fort Campbell? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Commissioner Pritchard? Mr. Kasky, mm -hmm. um, so this has worked out 
pretty much beneficial because it helps us to relieve overcrowding in our facility? Yes. Um, it's actually been extremely um, beneficial to us because when we get to capacity, um, in most instances, Fort Campbell, uh, they have 16 large dog kennels. At any given time, like this past week, uh, we got to capacity. They had uh, 12 of those 16 kennels open, so we were able to move several dogs up to that facility. Um, four of those have already been adopted at Fort Campbell, so it's really helped us um, control capacity, especially now we're in the middle of kitten season. Uh, so this last week we sent about 15 to 20 cats and kittens up there because they only had about four in the facility. So, so it's working out. It's working out very well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Good job. I think that thing's going well, not only uh, from an uh, animal standpoint, but from a financial standpoint both. So thank you. All right, next we have uh, Mr. Ed Moss. Uh, with a veterans treatment court update. Good evening, Ed. How you doing, sir? I'm wonderful, what about you? I'm doing outstanding, thanks for asking. So I wanted to come uh, to this body again and give a update brief as it relates to where we are with the Montgomery County Veterans Treatment Court. And as you look on page one and two of the handouts that I, that I uh, gave you, it highlights that we have 59 current participants in the Montgomery County Veterans Treatment Court. And, and you know that number is different than what we're used to operating with. It actually is a 15% reduction uh, as it relates to our uh, participant capacity. And that is directly relatable to COVID-19 and not having uh, court for upwards of 90 uh, to 100 days or so. However, that, that number is going to uh, rise we have two participants that we're gonna vote on coming to the Veterans Treatment Court tomorrow, which put us to 61, and I had orientation today, uh, and there's 12 prospective participants uh, that are trying to get to the Veterans Treatment Court, and we're gonna vote on those participants on July the 30th. So if, if those individuals go through, as I anticipate, we will be right around 73 to 74 participants uh, in the Veterans Treatment Court. Switching to Page three, uh, it shows quarter two that we had 11 participants that entered the Veterans Treatment Court. It also highlights the primary charge and the other charges that are associated with those individuals as well. The average age for those participants who entered was 37.8, were 38 years old, uh, five active service members from Fort Campbell, uh, six veterans. Eight of those participants has a mental health diagnosis as well. Going to page four, quarter two, 2020, it shows that we had two participants that was terminated from the program. One was terminated due to, well, both of them was voluntary withdrawal, but one was non-compliance of the Veterans Treatment Court guidelines, and the other was due to continued use of illegal substances and this participant did not want to go into an inpatient treatment facility and or have the sanction uh, that was associated with the Veterans Treatment Court, so he decided to uh, voluntary withdraw and go to General Sessions Court and handle those charges accordingly. The last page uh, that, that I have is the graduates from the quarter two, uh, 2020, and we graduated nine uh, from the Veterans Treatment Court that, that program that we had was done virtually 95% primarily. The only, only, only individuals that we had in the courtroom was the court, per, uh, court participants who graduated. Family wasn't allowed to be in the courtroom. Um, the mayor came over, chief of staff came over, everyone else we had on the virtual platform. And we continue to use that virtual platform today uh, with all the participants. We wanna maintain the COVID-19 guidelines uh, and we're gonna push into the August 25th graduation when we possibly have 17 graduating as it stands right now. So that concludes uh, as it relates to what we are participant wise, uh, pending your questions. Any questions, Commissioner Leverett? Yes, I just, I'm just curious about something. Those with mental health um, diagnosis, uh, is a, 
who do you have a professional on staff making these diagnoses or they're sent to a facility? So we have a licensed clinical social worker that comes down from the VA that works with us. Yes, ma'am, but we also send them to outpatient for an additional assessment to address that mental health diagnosis. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Pritchard. Mr. Moss, I see that uh, a lot of them have adjudicated DUIs down to reckless driving. Do you have a recidivist rate? I used to I used to talk about a recidivism rate quite a bit because uh, I was very proud of the recidivism rate until COVID-19 hit. And unfortunately, due to having individuals being in the homes, not being able to receive the services they would normally receive, our recidivism rate went up substantially. Uh, so the next quarter, FY, I hope that goes back down to where it normally is, uh, and I'll be able to talk more uh, prominently about as we as how we're working with recidivism. Well, I look forward to hearing what you have to say next quarter. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Leverett, do you have another question? Yes, sorry. Um, do we have homeless veterans participating in your? Yes, ma'am, we do. Um, and that's a challenge for the Veterans Treatment Court because I'll give you a case in point. We have someone who came to orientation today. He's going through a divorce with his spouse. Uh, he has a he has four pretty serious charges. So essentially, right now he's living. He calls it couch surfing. He's living wherever he can live. But the problem is he receives VA benefits, a VA disability rating. So he makes too much money to qualify for homeless assistance. So I'm in the process of working with our veteran mentors to get him some housing until we can get everything squared away. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ed, thank you so much. Appreciate your passion for what you do, man. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you and have a great day. All right, Mr. Frank Tate, uh, IDB year-end update. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. Good evening. <clears throat> what is economic development? A common question in this industry, and one that I'm asked, and sometimes it can't be an easy answer. Although it is sometimes stated, it is anything it needs to be to progress your, forward, your community forward. The, C the CMC IDB is a change agent for developing the community but most importantly, being the provider for a resolution to our citizens and company needs. Two, year, two years ago, we recognized that the economic development in this community had been a community approach, and it still very much is. Today, companies are doing great things based on workforce skill sets and quality of life within Clarksville. In August of 2019, we were recognized as the number one best place to live, according to Money Magazine. They could not have been more correct, and here's why. <clears throat> As of June 30th, the CMC IDB closed out our fiscal year. Many would think it ended in a negative direction. Quite frankly, it, it ended with an opportunity for us to self-reflect and reinvent what we needed to be focusing on. That is our community. We are a community organization that is designed to market growth and foster job development by creating an environment to help our citizens. Our strategy is simple to put the county in a competitive position to grow, attract, and retain the types of companies we desire. The commercial office park, some of our accomplishments. The commercial office park has garnished attention since the commission voted unanimous, unanimously to support, and we are one more step away from completing the financial needs to move forward. The development of a pad site in the North Industrial Park, known to some of you as Project Battle Axe, was completed on time and under budget. And that was in partnership with the Tennessee Economic Community Development through a grant. And has brought more interest to our industrial development footprint. Developing virtual spec buildings last year and hangar facilities in partnership with the airport have put us in a position to be better prepared for the competition in regards to the COVID impact. Site visits are being done virtually today rather than setting foot on the site. Imagine buying a home sight unseen. We're walking, through piece, we're walking through parcels of property and vacant buildings and showing video imagery, much like many of our real estate agents in the community. The Aspire Foundation Blueprint Initiatives announced in 19 set a five-year goal of 5,000 jobs and $1 billion in capital investment. In fiscal year 20, our commitments 
were 1,242 new jobs added to the community with over 168 million in investment over the course of the next five years. Most recently, we learned of a 900 job commitment by Jero. Our fiscal year activity ran parallel with 1819 until the fourth quarter. Our site visits for the fourth quarter were flat. Mind you, COVID-19 began on March 16th for many of us. Therefore, we had to reinvent ourselves overnight. And we did just that by being prepared by conducting as much virtual as we did in the prior year. <clears throat> Out of the 19 site visits, we were, only tw we were only a few shy of the prior year. 18 and 19, we had 25 site visits. We responded to 44 requests for information and met extensively with our existing industries, especially during the COVID-19 outbreak. We also received over 640,000 in grants and as, as recently received another site development grant for a road project in the South Industrial Park. Development is happening, and I think it's important to know that. Almost every site in our portfolio has been shared at some point throughout the year. <clears throat> what that tells us by us monitoring our parcels and what is in our portfolio is how to prepare for the next 10 to 20 years. Do we need to focus on larger parcels? Yes. Do we need to focus on and, and be more equipped to serve smaller parcels? Yes. Our sweet spot today is between 25 and 100 acres, and that's by client request throughout the last year. But by identifying these needs of others, it helps us to determine how to go after grants, but more importantly, helps us target our desired industries. Again, we're focusing on desired industries that help the economic impact of our community. Our growth equates to new revenues and taxes. It is an important takeaway to know that the commitments previously mentioned, the 1,242 jobs and the 100 million in investment did not utilize the pilot program that we offer for incentives on the local level. We are competitively, locally, regionally, and internationally, but we do have some regional rivals that we're competing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Huntsville, Alabama, and I know it's a little difficult to see from up there, is the middle, is the middle area. Our housing market is 14% higher than theirs. Why is that? Supply and demand. We have fewer homes on the market than any of the, comp any of the communities that we compete with. Companies today are looking and want to know where their kids will go to school, what new neighborhoods are being built, and what our growth patterns look like. They're also paying very close attention to utility cost, health care, transportation, infrastructure, and all of these items are vital roles in, our co in, in a company's decision to stay here and or locate here. <clears throat> Lastly, this annual status report helps us set a benchmark as to how to become better and be more equipped to help serve our community. Commissioners, great things are happening in Clarksville, Montgomery County. To despite today's challenges, our observations show that our future is looking very bright over the next year. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Any, any commissioners, any questions of Mr. Tate? And I will provide you this via email. Thank you, Frank. All right. Uh, next on our agenda is our zoning resolutions. Before we get into those, Jeff, I think you said you had a minute and a half is what you said that you wanted to talk to us about the census. Sure thing. And uh, I'll keep talking about census probably till October, November time frame here. And we'll just get this slide up. I think we're looking for the census slide. Yeah, we are, it's the next one. How do I advance? County, uh, all the way down to different census tracts and can go in Washington, D.C. included in there as well. Uh, statewide, 61.4% back in 2010. Statewide response before uh, boots were on the ground was 65%. So we're getting close to that, but this has been relatively flat the last three or so weeks. So that's been a little discouraging. So I would just encourage you all 
Uh, Montgomery County has been flat. Clarksville is the only thing that's been growing here recently. And, and by growing, I mean about a, a tenth of a point every couple days, uh, which is just a couple dozen people every week taking their census. You know, we got the bulk of the people who are going to do it, but I encourage you and your family members to just spread the word wherever possible. Uh, I talked to the cashiers at Publix, the guy who drops off the pizza, uh, the folks at the recycling centers. I don't, you know, I'll tell anyone about the census. I keep some materials in my car at all times. Uh, as you see there, there's a, f a few key county districts that are below or near 50%. So if you're in those five, eight, nine, 13, and 16, uh, if you want to come up with some unique ways, I know COVID is really suppressing community outreach right now, but uh, through social media, church networks, family networks, whatever you can do to get the word out and just challenge people to, uh, have you done the census? Have you taken the census? Well, it's real easy. Here's the website, uh, my2020census.gov. Uh, do it for our community. So that's, uh, I'll give you an update every month from here on out on how our numbers are doing, but uh, I feel like we need just a little boost right now uh, in the summertime. And as we maybe get out and talk to a few people we haven't seen in a while, please encourage them to do this. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate that. All right, we have two zoning resolutions tonight. Uh, Jeff, if you're okay with it, we'll do CZ9, then we'll do a public hearing, and sure. then we'll come to CZ10. Uh, so CZ9 2020 is the application of Allensworth Farm Partners LLC, John and Mary Allensworth, from AG to M2. Jeff? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is the Planning Commission's case number Z CZ9 2020. The agent on this is Larry B. Watson for the Allensworth Partnership. Uh, this is probably one of the largest rezoning cases you'll see uh, in your term as a commissioner. It's 552.66 acres. Uh, it's a portion of three different parcels, uh, as you can see, and I don't have the laser pointer here, but uh, at the top of that map there is Guthrie Highway. The northeast to southwest line that splits these parcels is the R.J. Corman rail line. And then the south border is Charles Bell Road, and the east border is Hampton Station Road. Uh, if you know the large TVA substation that's on Charles Bell Road, that's that large industrial parcel to the lower left of the picture. Uh, this parcel is also behind uh, the trailer company, as well as Jostens uh, and uh, TCAT out there right off Industrial Boulevard. So a, a large piece of property that spans uh, from north to south and east to west out there. It's currently zoned ag and they're wishing to go to M2. Next slide. And there's a little more zoomed out view. You can see where the interstate is. Exit four is just outside the view on the left. Uh, Google to the north of that property. So a, a large expanse uh, does split the property uh, north and south of the railroad tracks. I don't have the individual acreage of each little corner of it, but all together it's 550 acres. Uh, it is an extension of the zoning classification to the west. Next slide. And you can see on this uh, slide you have green representing ag zoning. Light green would be your estate lots. Uh, yellows and oranges are your R1 to R4. And then black or gray is your other industrial M1 and M2 zones. Uh, it's in County District 19. It's an existing agricultural land with rolling hills, currently being row cropped, and the property has frontage on Guthrie Highway, Charlesville Road, Hampton Station. The area is uh, also bisected by the rail line. The applicant's statement of use, the Clarksville Montgomery County IDB has entered into an option agreement to purchase the Allensworth Farm and the surrounding parcels. The IDB has received considerable interest for rail served sites of seven to 200 acres. It's in the rural area of the growth plan. Next slide. We typically won't show you this map, but I think it's important for this zoning case that uh, the newly adopted growth plan, which was accepted by the state back in January, uh, we had chosen with the committee to uh, adjust the east part of the county pretty heavily. Previously, this was all in what we would call a planned growth area with the rural area ringing the outside. Uh, in the rural area, applicants cannot apply for anything greater than estate lots or at very least uh, one acre or maybe three quarters of an acre if you get E1A. Uh, the reason that this was done was to sort of preserve this corridor, allow the IDB and the other industrial tenants in here to hopefully finish over the next 20 years their growth and then allow the residents if they want to move in, they can move in um, after that point. Uh, as you know, we had uh, an industrial uh, 
uh, site plan a little over a year ago that caused uh, some trouble out there, a lot of public hearings, a lot of information went out regarding it, and it's because even though the land was there before and zoned before, the homes came in and then the site came in. So if we can get as much of this built as possible before we put more homes near these sites, uh, that'll I think help both the community as well as future residents. Uh, it's a lot easier to choose to live next to something when it's already there than to have something pop up in the future. So that's why this middle area was kept in rural area. Uh, urban growth boundary off exit four there, we're uh, off Cracker Barrel Drive, Oakland Road to the west and then to the south, that's the uh, urban growth boundary that used to be planned growth area and a mix of rural area off of exit eight. So this is right smack dab right in the middle of rural area. Next slide. And I'll just ask you as I keep talking, just every five, there's a lot of pictures and I'll try to uh, read you through this. So the TVA power stations to your rear here, this is uh, Charles Bell Road going back uh, toward the property. And there's that substation here from the property looking to the west. And a lot of these are just going to be row crop because that's what this uh, property is primarily used for right now. I will say there has been some concerns raised by citizens over drainage out here. Um, agricultural land, when it's not well managed uh, or, or graded properly, can cause some issues. So future development of this site could actually improve the drainage situation out there by directing it to detention ponds and in the appropriate areas. Uh, we did take a picture of every house either on the site. Uh, there is a house site included in this as well as a couple that surround it. Uh, if uh, any of you have been out on either Charles Bell Road or Hampton Station Road, you pretty much have seen what this area looks like. Uh, flat to rolling hills, row crops, and a few homes. There's one of our signs, <coughs> one of the homes, uh, there it is there, one of the homes that's listed. We did put three signs on this property, one at every major frontage. Here's Guthrie Highway, again, another sign. Okay, uh, department comments of note. Uh, the gas and water system, obviously this area is not currently served by the adequate water and sewer or gas that they would need, but that would all be constructed uh, at the time of application depending on the end user. Uh, we did receive a traffic assessment. Uh, we had the, um, the applicant average out what a typical between shift work and data center, so we know that this isn't all going to be shift work. We know it's not all going to be data center. It's going to be a mix of all that. So we took sort of the mean of our average daily trips right now. Uh, it was submitted. It was reviewed by um, the county engineer as well as the MPO, and it was found to be acceptable. Uh, there will be improvements, as is with most uh, industrial users. Uh, for instance, if there is an entrance on Guthrie Highway, it's more than likely that working with TDOT, you're gonna have to do some improvements to Guthrie Highway. Similar thing with Charles Bell Road. Uh, again, this is a rezoning, so we're gonna have to judge at the time of site plan uh, what it's gonna be. If it's gonna be something like Google, a lot of acres with a few jobs or uh, work that spreads over the course of a day, uh, maybe not as many improvements. If you're gonna have a lot of truck traffic uh, or shift work, you're gonna want more improvements, but we'll have to judge that when uh, the applications come in. Uh, this is in the Rossview planning area. <clears throat> Impacts of proposed development would be increased traffic, noise, and light, the additional potential for truck traffic, shift work traffic, increase in intense industrial uses. Uh, I will say staff did share some of the concerns that we did receive from the community uh, regarding the industrial properties in general out there, uh, about the amount of acreage, uh, the type of jobs that we would be luring here, and the average wages. However, uh, staff does recommend approval. Uh, the proposed request is consistent with the adopted land use plan. The M2 zoning proposal is an extension of the existing M2 zoning to the west. The proposal will permit the expansion of established industrial park in an area identified in the land use plan and the land use opinion map. Uh, this, uh, the submitted traffic assessment identifies anticipated required improvements to Guthrie Highway and Charles Bell Road. A specific traffic study will be required at the development stage to determine the phasing of those requirements and no adverse environmental effects uh, impacts were identified relative to this request and any adequate infrastructure will, will be able to serve the site. Uh, I'll just remind the commission that depending on the end user 
it, TDEC or EPA could be involved, and that's who would re review any environmental uh, impacts in the future, depending on the end user. Um, Planning Commission also recommends approval of this. Uh, we will say that it's, uh, it is well suited for industrial uses out there uh, because of the rail line and the other in industry in the area. Any questions of Mr. Tyndall regarding CZ9 2020? We will now go into public hearing to hear comments related to CZ9 2020. I know we have some folks down in our training room uh, that want to speak to this application. Uh, I hope y'all can hear me. We would ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. Uh, we'd ask that you give us your name and your address, and if you're acting as an agent, please let us know that as well. So is there anyone in the audience to speak on behalf of CZ9 2020? spot. It is an industrial area and has been. So we don't think it's any kind of spot zoning. We don't think it's prejudicial to anybody. Uh, I don't know. You know, the old days when you had plants that smelled, I can remember BF Goodrich. I can remember Frosty Moore. Those of you as old as I am probably remember them too. But you drive down Duster Boulevard, you don't smell anything. And you don't, I don't know what's going to go in there. Nobody does. But they are regulated by the federal government as to whether or not they will be allowed to do anything and make sure that they're under their control on that. But all I can say is it needs to be done. Uh, it's perfect for this. Any questions? Any questions of Mr. Watson? Yeah. Mr. Watson, I see no questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and I appreciate your consideration. Is there anyone else in the audience to speak on behalf of CZ9 2020? Yes, Mayor. Brian Tate with the uh, Industrial Development Board, 25 Jefferson Street, Clarksville, Tennessee. <clears throat> As you all can see on your old map, there's um, the green area to the west of that site is, is two other parcels. Uh, one is the five megawatt substation that TVA has put in place and has been in place since the 60s. International Boulevard houses roughly 10,000 jobs in our community on a day-to-day -day basis. What this, what this milestone um, zone does for the community is it helps place us in a position for the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, as Mr. Tyndall mentioned in his notes, Infrastructure is currently not in place on this site, but it is fair, it is in close proximity of International Boulevard and Charles Bell Lane. And as a director of the IDB, um, I was a part of the negotiations for the option agreement that is in place between uh, the Allensworth family. The Allensworth family has spoken to the adjacent property owners and they are comfortable with the industrial footprint that could, could potentially be there. 
Um, currently, the option with the IDB is for 424 acres. That is everything south of the RJ Corman rail line. Uh, that's between Charles Bell Lane and Hampton Station Road. Any questions? Any questions of Mr. Tate? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Anyone else in the audience to speak on behalf of CZ9 2020? I can't tell if anybody's up walking up there or not. Okay. Oh. Well, I heard somebody say something. Oh, okay. Anyone in the audience to speak in opposition to CZ9 2020? Yes. Yes, just a moment, Mayor. Good evening, everybody. Um, each of you have heard from me earlier today. Um, I'm not sure how many of you read my email or um, have considered my concerns. My name's Ashley Burnett. Um, my family and I live at 3016 Eliza Drive. Um, we are adjacent to Charles Bell Road, uh, which is right near the property in question. Um, so I don't know who was surveyed or spoken to, but um, myself and several members of our community have serious concerns and are in strong opposition of this rezoning. Um, we have some sincere environmental concerns um, and how an M2 rezoning would impact our area, um, how it would impact the children that we're raising, uh, the schools that they attend, the roads where they play, the backyards where they play on their swing sets. Um, I myself have very serious concerns about the health and safety of my children, and I know there are others in our community who feel the same way. Um, I ask you to please consider those, um, those concerns for our health and safety. Um, I also noticed that Mr. Tate pointed out that um, Clarksville is not nearly as, so how can we bring additional industry to the area if we have nowhere for anyone to live? So perhaps we could consider rezoning this for R1 and provide some additional housing in the area and give these people places to live when they have work to go to. I think there are lots of other options um, that aren't M2 that might have a smaller footprint on the area, might have a smaller impact on the community and might help restore our faith in humanity and hope that other people do care about the residents of Clarksville. So I ask you to please consider these families, um, consider again, the children that we're raising and our future for the next 10 to 20 years. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else in the audience to speak in opposition to CZ9 2020? Yes, Mayor, we have one more. Can I go ahead? Hello, my name is Janai Holland. I live at 3041 Eliza Drive. I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today about this rezoning. Let me say a couple of things. The gentleman before had said, we wanna quickly build before you put any more houses there. The houses are already there. There are four huge subdivisions there. Beach Grove, Warrior Farms, Hartley Hill, and Hickory Wild. The houses are there. When we moved there, it was agricultural, we understand that the land is gonna be developed, but you are putting in M2 and going by your own bylaws, M2 is not compatible with residential areas. The homes are already there. We're asking you to reconsider, make it housing. If at all possible, make it M1. M2 is not compatible with the homes that are there. There are pregnant women. There are young children. I have young children. We're already here, so don't think it's benign. It's not benign. If you've not been there, get in your car and go down Charles Bell Road and directly across from where they're going to build this, there is Beach Grove subdivision. They're between the battery acid plant, Beach Grove subdivision, and now this new area to be developed. The houses are already there. And something else the gentleman that went before me said, Frosty Moore, I was born here and I remember Frosty Moore being here. Just because it doesn't smell, doesn't mean it's not harmful. It can absolutely be harmful. It can poison our air, it can poison our water. Why are you even considering changing this to M2 when you know all these houses are back there? 
when you know all these residents are back there. Let me tell you a little bit about my neighborhood. It is a beautiful neighborhood. It is a mixed neighborhood, black, white, Asian, yellow, green, retired military make up the majority of our residents. Do you wanna do this to your retired military people? These are our forever homes. I have worked every day since I was 17. I put my life savings into this home. I have checked every box being a good American citizen. I've worked every day since I was 17. I saved my money. I bought my forever home. I moved back here with my children. And now we're gonna be living behind. And it is, we are right there, especially Hartley Hills. Hartley Hills is right next to where this land's gonna be developed. Is there anywhere else that you can do M2? Does it have to be right here? Because the homes are already there. And I think I've made all my forever home, military family, we're all working class. No one in our subdivision is rich. We all worked for these homes. Please don't do this. Please consider something else. One last thing. Since you're asking for M2, you must have some idea what type of industry you want back there. Do you already have someone that's interested in it? Let us know so we know what we're up against. I thank you. Please reconsider. Thank you very, very much for allowing us to have the opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. All right, we'll now close the public hearing on CZ9 2020. Jeff, CZ10 2020. Application of Sulin, uh, Jeff, I'll let you go with that one. Uh, of Sunil from R1 to C5. Yes. Party of uh, Arun, Arunagiri and Sunil. Agent is Joel Ragland of Gobel and Yao. Uh, this is a 0.74 uh, portion of a property. Uh, next slide. So this is a long, thin piece of property off of 41A. Uh, next slide. And they're only requesting that the frontage be zoned at this time. The current zoning of this parcel is R1, and it, they're requesting C5. It is an extension of C5, which is the dark blue in this picture. And you can see it's to the north and in the area. Uh, it's in County Commission District 15. It's an existing single-family residential home on site with a sloped rear yard. The applicant's statement is the property owner desires to utilize the front portion of the parcel for the construction and operation of a dental practice. It's in the urban growth boundary in the Sango area of the uh, planning area. It has a previous zoning case from 2006, uh, CZ 29, 2006. Next slide. Here it is as you approach it on 41A. Next slide. Uh, there's that house, if you've seen our sign out there, and that house uh, is between the church and some apartments. Next slide. There's the apartments to the left <clears throat> and the church to the right. Uh, there were no department concerns or comments received on this application. Uh, staff recommends approval. The zoning request is consistent with the adopted land use plan. The property in the area continues to be a transition both before and after the right-of-way improvements of 41A South. Commercial interests remain strong along this corridor with a mix of commercial, multifamily, and single-family demands. The property has frontage on 41A South which is an arterial highway near a signalized intersection of Sango Drive, McAdoo Creek Road. Uh, C5 zoning designation is the highway and arterial commercial district. Adequate infrastructure serves the site and no adverse environmental issues were identified at this time. Complaining Commission also recommends approval. Any questions of Mr. Tindall? Commissioner Albert? Jeff, if they only asking for zoning for the If you would part. pull your microphone to you a little bit, please, sir. If they're only asking for the front part to be rezoned, are, is the rest of the land going to be landlocked? Uh, no, they will not subdivide it at this time. So they're just going to use the front portion for the business. They've already been informed of this, so uh, they can combine it with one of the properties next door if they need to, or they can always uh, leave a flag back to it uh, for future development. The rear of that property is well over three acres, so you could have a few homes back there or another business. I think they'll decide that in the future. I think that's a, an appropriate question for their agent too. Uh, but that was brought up with the applicant when they did apply. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of Mr. Tindall by the commission? All right, we'll now go into public hearing to hear comments related to CZ 10 2020. 
Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on behalf of this application? I'm Joel Ragland. I am the attorney for the applicant uh, in this matter. He does plan to use the front portion uh, of the property which he has purchased out on Highway 41A South for the construction of a new dental office. Uh, and uh, we appreciate uh, your consideration of this request. Is he gone? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Is anyone else in the audience to speak on behalf of CZ 10 2020? No, sir. Anyone to speak in opposition to CZ 10 2020? No, sir. All right. We'll now close the public hearing uh, on our zoning cases. Jeff, thank you. Excellent. I have to present on the next, uh, the first resolution today. Resolution 27-1 is a resolution accepting the public improvements program and capital budget 2020 through 2020-21 through 24-25 compiled by Montgomery County and approved by the Clarksville Montgomery County Regional Planning Commission. Any questions uh, regarding 27-1? I see no questions. Commissioners, you'll note this item has an asterisk beside it. It will be placed on the consent agenda unless someone chooses to pull it. Resolution 27-2, resolution of the Montgomery County Board of Commissioners approving amendments to the 2021 school budget. Any questions regarding 27-2? Seeing no questions again, commissioners, this item is scheduled for the consent agenda. Resolution 27-3 is a resolution to amend the rules and regulations of the Montgomery County Animal Care and Control. Any questions regarding 27-3? Again, this item will be placed on the consent agenda. Resolution 27-4 is a resolution to amend the makeup of the Montgomery County Loss Control Committee. Any questions on 27-4? Again, that item is scheduled for the consent agenda. Resolution 27-5, resolution to amend the internal operating rules of the Montgomery County Board of Commissioners. Any questions regarding 27-5? Again, this item is scheduled for the consent agenda. Resolution 27-6 is a resolution of the Montgomery County Board of Commissioners to transfer alcohol treatment reserve fund monies for the renovation of space at Veterans Plaza. Any questions regarding 27-6? That item is also scheduled for the consent agenda. 27-7 is a resolution to repeal resolution 2412, altering the procedures of public hearings to be conducted as required by law before the Montgomery County Commission. Any questions regarding 27-7? Seeing no questions, again, that item is scheduled for the consent agenda as well. Uh, without objection from the commission, without seeing any objection, we'll suspend the rules uh, to hear resolution 27-8. I see no objections. So 27-8 is a resolution to adopt and implement a policy regarding the deployment and use of thermal camera temperature scanners to be used in certain designated county facilities in certain designated county functions. Any questions regarding 27-8? Seeing no questions under our reports, uh, you'll see we have four reports listed. Uh, the nominating committee nominations, I'll let uh, Chairman Gannon, if you'd like to go over those, sir. Is a two-year term 
Commissioner Chris Rasnick is eligible for a reappointment for his first full two-year term to expire July of 2022. And Commissioner Rashida Leverett is eligible for reappointment for her first full two-year term to expire July of 2022. Joe Creek, Commissioner Joe Creek, is nominated to replace Commissioner Jerry Albert for a two-year term to expire July of 2022. And then on the Regional Library Board, it's a three-year term. Jacqueline Crouch, who was recommended by the Library Board, is nominated to fill the unexpired term of Gerald Beavers with term to expire in July of 2021. And we will put those in a form of a motion next meeting under the consent agenda. Thank you, Commissioner Gannon. Under County Mayor nominations, Emergency Medical Services, Commissioner Joe Creek nominated to replace Commissioner Larry Riccone for a three-year three term to expire July 2023. Uh, Fire Protection Committee, Commissioner Garland Johnson nominated to replace Commissioner David Harper for a three-year term to expire July 2023. Judicial Commissioner Darlene Sample nominated for reappointment for a one-year term to expire July 2021. Rebecca Becker nominated for a reappointment for a one-year term to expire July 2021. And Carolyn Honholt, part-time nominated for reappointment for a one-year term to expire July 2021. And then the library board, uh, Gerald Beavers nominated to replace Jacqueline Crouch for a three-year term to expire July 2023. Dottie Mann nominated to fill her second three-year term to expire July 2023. Joyce Norris nominated to fill her second three-year term to expire Jul July 2023. Commissioner Jason Knight has been filling the unexpired term of Monroe Gildersleeve and now eligible to fill his first two, his first full two-year term to expire July 2022. And the Rail Service Authority, commissioners, I don't have a name for that. I will have one for you uh, next Monday night. I apologize for that. Under county and may mayor appointments, uh, by County Solid Waste Board, Jeff Truitt appointed to replace J. Alberta for a six-year appointment to expire July 2026. Building and Codes International Board of Appeals, Wally Crow appointed to replace Ed ne Neely for a five-year term to expire July 2025. And the 911 Emergency District Board, Chief David Crockerell appointed to fill unexpired term of Chief Ainsley with term to expire January 2023. And Public Records Commission, Skip Burchett appointed to fill the unexpired term of Kurt Bryant as Information Technology Director as an ex officio member. Any questions about any of the nominating committee or the county mayor nominations or appointments? All right, and commissioners, you'll see that each one of those uh, reports, those four reports, are scheduled for uh, uh, the consent agenda. You'll see under reports filed, the Board of Equalization Training Certification. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, number one, uh, Loretta Bryant, her husband John's in the hospital in St. Thomas. We ask that you keep uh, John Bryant in your prayers. I'd also like to announce uh, our diversity task force members that our uh, diversity officer, Miss Michelle Lau, has put together what I think is a, a stellar group of people that are gonna start addressing diversity issues with inside of our community. Uh, Dr. Eva Gibson, Tasha White, Eric Horton, Kylie Barnell, Zoe Jackson, Joseph Rodiker, Lisa Gaines, Terry Jelinski, Lisa Boyd, Vicki Trinidad, Becky Wright, Lanika Williams, David Shelton, Farrellyn Browning, Michael Marin, Jamal Bradley, Marlene Livesay, Jennifer Warwick, Cindy Hemmingson, Barbara Green, Selena Lawrence, Joanne Garcia, Michelle Lau, Ed Morris, and Alex Murray Melendez. And so uh, special thanks to Michelle for getting this put together. Two other quick announcements. Uh, if you have any suggestions for the 2021 legislative agenda, please email them to Michelle Newell or Melissa Smith. And actually I have two more announcements. Uh, you should have in your packet uh, a fundraiser barbecue uh, that's being put on by the sheriff's office 
uh, this coming Friday, or excuse me, July the 17th from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, you can pick up at the at 1182 Seven Mile Ferry Road, the M Montgomery County Conservation Club, or they will deliver upon request. And uh, hats off to the sheriff's office, to Sheriff Fuson and all of his folks. Uh, this is a fundraiser for Dwayne Gray of Gray Smoke Barbecue. And during uh, several major incidents, uh, Gray Smoke Barbecue and Dwayne, they have provided uh, food for uh, our first responders, specifically during uh, the Kirby Wallace manhunt and also during the COVID response. And so uh, he's ex experienced a medical injury, uh, hadn't been able to work for a couple of months, and this is just the sheriff's office uh, just saying or trying to give back to a business that's been very, very supportive of our community and specifically our first responders. And then lastly, commissioners, you should have an email uh, in your inbox from me regarding uh, a new executive order that's coming out regarding masks, and I would ask for you to uh, be sure and read that, and if you have any questions, please feel free to give me a call. Commissioner Johnson, you have a question? Just one last comment if you don't have anything else. No, sir, I think I'm done. Uh, just as a point of information to our other commissioners in the room and uh, the rest of our staff, uh, we have a very important day happening today. Uh, not so very long ago, our illustrious, energetic, the same guy every time you see him, no matter where he is, always ready to handle anything you throw at him, Mayor was born. So uh, it looks like all the windows are covered, so I don't think we have to worry about any glass cracking. So if you would join me, <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> happy birthday. Yeah, th th thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we stand adjourned.